Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Wild Tendon in the Colorado Rockies, featuring Kelly Moody and Gabe Crawford. Kelly Moody produces the Ground Shots podcast, which is an audio project that features conversations and storytelling about our relationship with ecology through creativity and philosophy. Gabe Crawford collects the seeds of native food plants, fruit trees, berries, and other natives and exotics to plant feral orchards and wild gardens. I spoke with Kelly and Gabe on September 5th about their recent Plant-A-Go trek through the Colorado Rockies, where they collected and planted the seeds of indigenous first foods. We talked about planting in the wild, the concept of wilderness, the benefits of moderate disturbance, climate change, and the destruction of ranching, among other topics. My name is Gabe Crawford. I'm from Durango, Colorado, and I've been traveling around the West for a couple of years, really exploring um, wild tending and different traditional and uh, quote unquote non-traditional wild foods and um, have been really trying to make it um, a reality planting these all the time and getting to know uh, the ecologies in the West in the context of climate change and how we can plant uh, food for food sovereignty and for wild animals and for and just to uh, be in good relations with the land. Howdy. Uh, I'm Kelly Moody and I'm originally from Southern Virginia and grew up in a rural area in Southern Virginia and um, lived for a while in Asheville, North Carolina, where I uh, did a lot of farming. And then since then, kind of been on the road in the West. It's probably been like six or seven years now that I've been kind of traveling a lot in the West. And a lot of that time has been spent kind of doing plant research and land research and getting to know different ecologies around the West <clears throat> and spending time out on the land uh, in my truck camper or some kind of incarnation of a uh, space that I've been mobile with and over that time I've compiled kind of like a lot of writings and research and notes and um and also started a podcast a couple years ago because I felt kind of like that would be a really interesting um platform to start sharing stories from people that I've been meeting on the road so that's been kind of a project that's been unfolding for a couple of years. The Ground Shots podcast and Clibri has been on my podcast before. And uh, so right now, my biggest focuses are the podcast and continuing the research writings uh, that I've been doing. And um, yeah, just trucking along with that work. And uh, Gabe definitely had an influence on me, too, with the way that he does his work in the world. So it's been really exciting to kind of have a new view, um, especially with the kind of wild tending and uh, human participation piece that he's really focused on in his work. So, Right, right. So the human participation piece, you, uh, you both alluded to that. And so maybe we can start there with just briefly talking a little bit about uh, what wild tending is, because what we're going to be talking about today is a trip that you all just took uh, on foot through the Colorado mountains where you were focusing on wild tending. Yeah. Awesome. Um, lately, I've been having to reevaluate <clears throat> uh, the word wild tending and how I use it 
and um because I've really been observing the blurred line and ultimately really the lack of a line between what is wild and what is not and wildness as a social construct of European colonial culture and um, seeing more cultural landscapes and landscapes as reflections of pe- the people and cultures who tend them. And um, so coming to the participation piece, it's like the root <clears throat> of the word <clears throat> participation is part and because whether we participate in a place or not, we're still a part of it. And um, the thing I focus on and have been focusing on with my work is that humans are a part of the landscape and co-create it, whether they know it consciously or not, you know, because of just our actions have uh, consequences that ripple through the web of life. So, Um, Being wise with that power and figuring out what that means in the context of today with the resources at hand today and with the changing world today, uh, wild tending or just um, living in good relations with the land has come to be this adventure in learning how can I participate with the land in a way that is very counter culture because it seems like the the current the strong current like a the river that our culture is is really based in extraction and not being reciprocal and seeing that reciprocity piece is really the foundation of our whole lives and what it means to be in good relations with <clears throat> the land, whether you live in a suburb or public land or rural area, that there are really creative ways that people can find to have really interesting, creative, good reciprocal relationships with the land. And the Colorado Trail was a way to not only explore what that means on vast pieces of public land by seeing particularly what's happening in this part of the Southern Rockies and how we can participate in it and plant a lot of first food seeds along the way, but just to explore the cultural, economic, and political aspects of, of the ecology of the Southern Rockies. So basically we um, wanted to do something this summer that was not, being in a car a lot, which has been my life a lot the past few years. And, and, and we wanted to get in the field and study the landscape and also uh, find ways to participate in the landscape um, that felt good. And so I've always wanted to do, I mean, I've done a walk before I did the Camino <clears throat> de Santiago years ago. Um, but I, we were just trying to decide between whether to do a walk and like, um, have our possessions kind of honed down to some simple things to really focus on just like uh, being with the land in that way. Or we were trying to decide whether to do like a base camp thing where we went out and camped somewhere and like went out on like day hikes and came back and we decided to do the walk instead of base camp i don't really know why exactly but we just decided maybe it was me i was like let's just do it and gabe did the colorado trail a couple years ago four or five years ago and at that time he didn't have the same perspective on the land so it's been really cool too to see him see the land in a new way so he's familiar with the trail which was helpful for like navigating it and um so we decided to do a walk that is a tr- is a through hike that people do uh you know for the sport of it a lot and that's like generally the culture around through hiking is kind of like seeing how fast uh you can go or 
how lightweight your gear how lightweight your gear is or how um many miles in a day you can do or whatever um but for us though by the end we were ready to be kind of done and like we did some longer days and we were also in more better shape we we definitely um took probably twice as much time as most people to do this walk and we also sent ourselves seeds that we felt like were relevant to the landscape that Gabe had already witnessed before like he kind of knew what landscapes we're going to be walking through and what areas we're going to be um seeing and stuff so uh we sent ourselves seeds of some of the yeah a lot of these were seed bundles that you gathered last summer Mm -hmm. with Phoenicia and other folks um that are seeds that like biscuit roots yampa mariposa Mariposa lilies. lilies like relevant seeds that are also like well, well, maybe you can explain more, like, well, why why you decided to pack those seeds? Um, the, cult, the, they're all very culturally significant first food plants, and um, with climate change, uh, their the habitats that they like are changing, you know, and so we as we walk through the Southern Rockies, which is really high, very high altitude, um, the mission was to explore what's happening at these higher altitudes and plant and basically move these first food seeds into higher altitudes because plants and ecologies are moving uh, to where it's more habitable for them with climate change and warming temperatures. They're moving farther north or higher in altitude. So the one of the baseline missions of it was, well, let's pack out a lot of these really important first food seeds, biscuit roots, wild onions, mariposa lilies, yampa, probably had six or seven different types of biscuit root, um, and lomatium in the lomatium genus. And we planted them all at the baseline, really, for the most part of at least 10,000 feet all the way up to at times uh, 12 or so thousand feet. Uh, Very experimental. We GPS pinpointed all of our plantings or spots with special plants that we found along the way or spots to come back to to plant. And, um, And really once, when I discovered these foods, it really just changed my life. It really changed everything because these foods are a living example of uh, re- of a living relationship between humans and ecology that is unlike anything people have ever heard of in our culture. And because the cultural, uh, these plants are like a living demonstration of human humans as ecological uh, habitat modifiers and ecological beings in a very positive way and in our culture we're really brought to believe that humans can only do damage and that we're separate and everything about us is just completely separate so hands off come and visit leave no trace leave just to come back later so we were really exploring that which was an interesting dynamic of planting first foods on public land and talking to people about it and having to have some interesting conversations. But yeah, re- looping back around, these are really important first food plants and it's an experimental planting project with climate change and just to really just to spread these seeds around because they're important. And so there's elements of food sovereignty wrapped up in it, uh, you know, ecological study, and um a lot yeah the the project didn't go as planned actually because uh we originally had this one like the a few goals just to plant as much as we could and then it morphed and evolved and it blossomed into this really more diverse study project of culture and ecology politics history everything you know, we we realize on the walk that we cannot separate any of that from what we're doing, and that for us, 
because uh, we both like to get really philosophical about things and explore principles that we can't in this work. It really just doesn't make sense to us to explore this and do this without weaving in the cultural, political, economic, historical context of all of it. Well, so for me, the, with the Ground Shots project as a bigger project that the podcast is a part of, part of my practice traveling and being on the land over the years has been this sort of writing, research, art making, uh, responding to the land and to the to the place and learning about it. And um, also I'm influenced a lot by this organization, Signal Fire, and you, you interviewed Amy Harwood, who is one of the founders of that organization, a nonprofit sort of group out of Portland, Oregon, that runs these retreats and walks and residencies for artists, getting artists into wild places to learn about those wild places and the sort of complicated ecological, cultural history of those places. And then they, we make work in response out there. And I've done two of their month long programs. And honestly, those experiences have really influenced the way that I approach a lot of my work and projects and seeing place in the land. And so I inevitably bring that those tools with me wherever I go. And I think I've influenced Gabe with that too, because yeah. uh, signal fire makes these readers where it's kind of like these uh, books full of writings, um, artist profiles and, um, history about the place where we are and all these things. And, um, and I, f I swear I read through these all the time and like, I get something new out of them every time. But for us on the trail, we were also really kind of curious about, uh, what happened here in so many ways. Cause if there's evidence, like there's evidence in the form of the gardens, you know, that that's, that's a kind of living archeology span that people don't really acknowledge is a real, um, thing, you know, and I think there's a blind spot there with, with archaeology and with anthropology and ethnobotany and botany <laughs> to acknowledge that huge piece of the living gardens as like an actual physical evidence of human interaction with the land left there. And also, uh, we were curious about, you know, why is this creek orange? You know, why, what, what's, what's, you know, because there's a mine up upstream and a lot of hikers probably don't even think twice about like, what, what's a, what's the mining history here? Like why, um, and there was actually like tons of people who were living way up in the mountains, like doing this mining thing, like 12 months out of the year. And like, just that part of the history too and how that uh, affected the land and is still affecting the land now is something we were, we didn't really realize we would be so curious about that colonial extractive history of the, of these so-called pristine wilderness areas that people are rec recreationally enjoying. Now, I think it's important to illuminate and highlight like the abuses of the land that have happened historically too, intertwined with like us discovering these gardens massive gardens of wild onions and mariposa lilies and biscuit roots and stuff that are there that it's hard to deny that that was that that humans maybe weren't involved with those gardens you know like i think um the whole weavings of these things like all the ways that we've had impact on the land and continue to um we were we were trying to be present to that as we walked you know even though it's hard sometimes like your body's tired and you know, you got to get to a certain point because there's only water at this place or that place, you know? Um, but we found ourselves very excited and curious and sometimes grieving and uh, just, yeah, trying to see the land through a lot of lenses while also walking, carrying all our possessions, you know, yeah. and carrying these seed bundles. And um, we, came up with the name plantigo which is like the the name of the plantain plant plantigo uh you know which is means white man's footsteps and and it was kind of like a humorous 
uh, healing. We're, we're like, well, we're literally planting as we go. So it's perfect. It's a perfect name for the project, but also let's reapproach what, you know, can come out of, uh, our footsteps too, you know, like, let's leave like wildflowers and food and first food and like seeds of healing growing out of our footsteps, you know? And so there was like, the the name of the project was like this humorous like aha this is a funny name and it makes sense and it's just like there's like something kind of cool about it too because it's humorous and it it's real and uh because the whole um the whole essence of the project was to see what's happening in the southern rockies to plant a lot of seeds and to really get to know um the the inseparability of culture history ecology economics and politics and the and to illuminate the the blind spots that um that the utes who are the traditional uh original inhabitants of this landscape to illuminate the blind spots in so many fields of study that they, along with like all the other indigenous first peoples were the landscape modifiers and habitat modifiers that uh, really influenced what the Europeans called pristine wilderness, you know? So we're constantly uh, trying to bring up and, and, and witness that like this whole wilderness thing and this wildness thing, it doesn't make sense. And it's like this social construct of, um, one of separation, racism and white supremacy and just how so many fields of study, especially like, you know, about ecology or climate change all of them leave out this this uh the the role of indigenous peoples you know and act like it doesn't exist i think that's changing though more every day yeah a lot of people are starting to realize uh the the blind spots in that but you know your book uh was it the failures of farming and the necessity of wild tuning but was that, that was that the book that you wrote about the national parks? No, that was road tripping at the end of the world. It, yeah, we were we obviously got you, your books you hanging like around your, you a lot. Like your books. But you know things like that as an example. You wrote about like the history of racism and the formation of these national parks, which pe- a lot of people go to the national parks and don't even realize yeah. that history. For example, you know, and I think with the Colorado Trail and the walk, a lot of the trails follow old Ute trails. And uh, which were, you know, the obvious path. Sometimes in some places, it's the only way through. And um, <clears throat> it's, you know, a lot of time people people don't realize that the walk that they're doing that's called the Colorado Trail. A lot of it is these deeply ingrained footpaths that have been there, been used for a really long time. Yeah, or the roads and highways passes that go through the mountains were originally uh migrational corridors of animals and of the utes going to their seasonal hunting and and wild food gathering spots so yeah and one thing also so the whole covid thing blew up like colorado is always crazy with tourism it's like the economy of colorado for the most part really in so many ways at least western colorado because it's not really much of an agricultural state on the in the Rocky Mountains. So tourism is this thing. And one thing that I was always just feeling really weird about and just always observing when we went into the towns was the, celebra- the celebration of mining culture, of extraction culture, and how people come to these places. And there's like this staged authenticity and romanticism around like the Wild West and mining and just how, and it's a really glorified history and the perspective we were walking through and the way we were witnessing the scars left on the landscapes from that 
we were really just kind of seeing how really it makes no sense to celebrate this history because this history straight up is one of genocide and ecocide and just a literal abuse of the land. And we're still experiencing the consequences of that today with like contaminated <clears throat> streams, mining portal, old mining portals, scarring mountainsides like pockmarks and um, big tailings, ponds. So, and seeing the contrast in the the happy face kind of Disneyland on one side of the mountain, like at, in, uh, by Copper Mountain, there's this huge mine on the 12 mile range. On the other side of that range is Breckenridge, which for listeners who know about Breckenridge, it's like Disneyland basically. And on the other side of the 10 mile range is this massive mine that just has terraced this whole mountain. There's these giant tailings ponds that are the size of small lakes. And we saw from an artistic perspective, the contrast, like what it takes to build that uh, Disneyland, you know, it, the, the, we saw like the reverse image of, of that Disneyland in the, in the mine and in the tailings pond and how people don't look at that. They don't think about it. You know, it's just, and just that, that's such a character trait of American culture is to like um, glorify in a false way uh, our culture and our history and not really acknowledge um, the reality of what our history is in essence which is a history of uh, cult of genocide and ecocide in so many ways so that was one thing that we were really seeing a lot in the land was the scars of civil, the scars of civilization, of industry, of politics and economics, and the gardens are scattered throughout that and how people call that pristine wilderness and just like the whole weird racist ideology of pristine virgin wilderness. And, you know, and it's like that people will, uh, call an area that's been mined to shit and that has been logged a couple times before it was put into wilderness protection, pristine wilderness. And we're like, wow, this is, it's funny, you know, that, that, that's, that's how our culture sees. And that wilderness is a, is a cultural landscape too. So like all these landscapes are cultural landscapes and the land, the health of the landscape reflects like the righteousness of the people who tend the landscape and we just were kind of walking slowly through this place and witnessing the land through that and seeing like what's reflected about us in these places. I just want to make a quick remark about the wilderness word and concept, uh, because yeah, I, I agree um, that using the word wilderness usually turns out to be the same as indigenous erasure at this point. Basically, that's that's the problem with the word is that it ignores the influence of indigenous people, Native Americans on the land. And so it, it makes it easier to continue ignoring the fact that uh, something's been taking, taken from something and, and something's been owed to them, you know. And it was the Wilderness Act of the 20s that really ensconced this concept um, legally, you know, and just from the viewpoint of, you know, uh, settler colonialists, uh, there is, I would say there's an aspect of it uh, to that act, which is understandable. And that there were some well-meaning people who were like, wow, look at how we're messing stuff up so badly. Okay. Everybody's just got to stop touching this for now. And so I get that, um, urge. I get that, uh, um, there were some well-meaning people who, who, who were like, who, who, who had that in mind. And the Wilderness Act did result in less industrial destruction of particular pieces of land since it was, it was put into place, you know? And so, yeah. um, the fact that, uh, now more and more people are starting to understand 
how the concept of wilderness is flawed is is great you know and now people are starting to understand oh these were not unpeopled landscapes these were peopled landscapes and in fact the uh um characteristics of this landscape were uh the direct results of people you know interacting with the landscape so that's great that people are now starting to see that and that in the meantime some land was set aside to not get destroyed more in the in in the meantime and of course you know um uh the the planting back now which is what you were engaged in there is what makes you know that that makes so much sense as the next step now because if these places are going to be restored not in the sense of restoring them to their original status since that can't happen when you have you know lakes of of mine tailings around but but restored in the sense of like a relationship is being restored uh between humans and the landscape then uh you know this um traditional activity of seeding which was really at the heart of wild tending activities that's um that's just essential and so it is fascinating that uh and also um uh, unusual or rare or not very common, uh, what you were doing, which was out there with wild seeds, uh, seeding these areas. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the, um, gardens that you found. You could, you've used this word gardens a lot of time, and that might be confusing for people who don't know much about wild tending. So maybe talk a little bit about this concept of gardens and then how it was that you were interacting with them. Um, yeah, that's really good. What you said, it really what you said really speaks to this kind of internal paradox i felt of like wow it's such a um because some people could misperceive real quick i just have to say like some people could misperceive what our perspective of like us being ungrateful for public land but like we really were just holding the contra the self-contradicting reality that like of the history of wilderness but how today like we really are so thankful for public land and for wilderness it's kind of like a it's a little bit of a paradox but um well it's it's tricky because it's almost like we have to protect it's like yeah. settlers r realizing that our culture is unsustainable and messed up but yet still practicing it yeah. <laughs> and like realizing we need to protect these places from ourselves or something, even though a lot of the like public land designations that are out there allow, continue to allow for certain types of extraction, like BLM land yeah. and national forest, you can still like basically extract oil if you want or log it, you know, in the case of national forests, like, so there's still like not even full protection so-called of these places, like don't touch in certain ways. But then, well, well, we actually can we can get the natural gas oil out of here if there's enough money involved. But that's another whole yeah. conversation. <laughs> but yeah. uh, there is like this sense of needing to protect. Well, we've been thinking a lot, too, about like the how the concept of private land ownership is like a yeah, as a construct affects the way we see land in this way too. the idea of of like so-called wilderness. It's like, OK, you have the cultivated controlled space inside the fence the known world the 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 domesticated space is on the inside and then outside the fence is the so-called wild lands that are chaos that are without humans you know that's like this dichotomy we've created in our minds and in the actual physical way that we live on the land and by creating by being like oh shoot like well we've we've fenced in so much land and we've kind of made a lot of mistakes and messed it up and and you know that and and we we should probably preserve some of this because well part of it is preserving the idea of that endless frontier that like romanticism of this sort of open frontier thing that a lot of Wild people West. were obsessed with but also it's like this afterthought of oh crap like all right uh if we don't do it now then um we are gonna have problems later whatever it's like uh 
So obviously, like, when somebody like Trump is trying to, like, sell off public land to oil companies to have it have them do whatever they want to it, even though a lot of public land that can still happen on. um, That's not a good thing. But I think. Yeah, again, just reiterating the idea that, like, uh, not acknowledging how these designations erase the indigenous histories of these places and the peopled histories of these places. Yeah, there's just like this, yeah, this complex problem with that, you know. But anyhow, so your question was about the gardens. The gardens. And, you know, the word garden, too, of course, is complicated and it's something we explored on my podcast together uh, is this sort of like where's that line between cultivated and wild I guess it's blurry it's always blurry so the word garden can can mean a, different things to different people um it can it can mean like a garden that it's its own autonomous being you know that it tends itself or it could be yeah. like a space of of the of ecology that um yeah. humans tended at some point but maybe yeah. we'll talk about it more well the i mean the etymology of it, it it really it it kind of means an enclosure um i in my own mind and heart i don't ref- reference these places as gardens but when i talk to people for like educational purposes i use the concept of garden because it's relatable and And because most people don't know about like the etymological root of garden and enclosure and all that, but um, the words and the concepts that make a lot more sense to me are like foodscapes. There's like the landscape and then there's the foodscapes and food sheds. Like there's water sheds and there's also literally these food sheds. And so the garden, the gardens that are, in the mountains in the Southern Rockies were these seasonal root digging and hunting places that a lot of the time were in these hot in these subalpine and alpine areas. And um, so this is almost like a soft form of archeology span using plants as the evidence rather than hard artifacts as the evidence. So this is like a living ecological evidence of human habitat, modification and tending and reciprocal engagement so we found um so much biscuit root the whole trail no matter where we were there was biscuit root the whole way particularly a kind of biscuit root called somop it's it's, it's in the somopterous genus of biscuit root they used to call it pseudosomopterous montanus or mountain parsley, but the the current Latin name is Somopterus lemoni. It's uh and and so we would come into these subalpine uh, valleys and kind of parks where there would be literally just carpets of this biscuit root, which has a long kind of starchy taproot, really sweet and pleasant tasting awesome just a great all-around food and then there would be a lot of mariposa lily and the calicordis genus and then uh various types of wild onions from like nodding onions to types of like wild chives and um wild garlic and there was some places where and uh other places where it was like this these biscuit roots the wild onion and garlic and osha all of these very culturally significant plant foods and medicines that have had historical uh, tending relationships from humans um, that were growing so thick that you really couldn't step on it if you were walking through it. And you couldn't help but step on it. You couldn't help but step on it, yeah, because it's just so thick. You know, every step you took would be on OSHA or biscuit root or onions and garlic. And, um, and from just like the practical point of view, like it would make sense that if you lived in the Rocky Mountain and high desert foothill area, that you would not live in any one place year round. You would be migrating back and forth seasonally to these areas where the food is the thickest and um, tending it the whole way, you know, and 
So the concept, the anthropo- white anthropological concept of hunter gatherers implies that they were just kind of wandering around hoping to find whatever they found, but it wasn't, it was a lot more sophisticated and complicated than that. They would really, um, they were planting back these wild foods as they gathered them and timing their arrivals and their stays in these places so that when they, when they were digging these foods, they could simultaneously tend them and plant them back. And so when they come back in the next years that there is, they're always basically just tending the populations of these. So they're living in a reciprocal relationship with them. And there's always going to be more for the next years and the next generations. I I found myself on the trail when we would try to talk with people about the gardens or the, these areas of uh, high density, culturally significant food, medicine plants, how to explain, because sometimes people are like, really like, but you're planting seeds and you and really like you really think that people planted these like th- just the it, it, a lot of people just have skepticism, you know, and also, of course, people are like, wait, you're planting seeds. That's bad, even though I don't even know why I think that's bad, but that feels weird that, that I don't know, because you're you're, you're like, on public if, land and you're not supposed to do that here because this is not where the garden enclosure is. You know, yeah. I don't know. It's like this what funny... if they take over and, and what if it's disastrous <laughs> if you plant these biscuit root seeds? But yeah, I remember yeah, if I could um, if I could stand a seed for a second, I would. I mean, it is worth pointing out that um, planting seeds on public land is Ill- illegal in a lot of cases. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or a gray area for sure. Yeah, right. it's hard to know. I mean, because that's that's yeah. one way in which the the land has been uh, conquered. It's not just that the people were driven away and killed, and that the land was repurposed for other extractive purposes, but that now to go in and to try to restore that relationship is itself considered illegal. <laughs> In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Yeah. Yeah, because it challenges that well it challenges the real history that um indigenous peoples were taken off the land and and genocided you know and it it forces our culture to have to acknowledge the peopleness the vast uh effect that humans had on the land historically because i think a lot of the excuses that were made is like well these people aren't doing anything here they aren't using the land uh, efficiently. They aren't taking care of this land the way that like the cultural mindset of the settler colonials, like the way that the way that they brought that cultural mindset and imposed it on the West or, or all over, not just the West. It, it forces our current culture to acknowledge that lens too, I think by considering um you know, or it's just like a challenge there, you know? So yeah. for us, I mean, talking to people on the trail, there's definitely some people who are like, this is so cool, you know, or like, wow, i never thought of it this way. And there's other people who are like, uh, I don't know. No one was outright like, this is bad. I mean, yeah. to be honest, there yeah. wasn't anyone actually who was like really getting on us about it necessarily and yeah. like a really bad negative way, but I found so myself you must not have, you must not have run into an actual botanist then. We actually well, did. We ran we into a, okay. yeah. Well, we we ran into a forest service person who was hiking the trail, and she seemed really interested in what we were doing in like a positive way. And oh, cool. We met this one girl who it, lives in California, who's a trained botanist, and she uh was really interested in what we were doing yeah and she thought it was really cool yeah we met biologists 
and botanists who literally had no idea what a bitter root or a biscuit root was. And I don't know. It's just, and then we didn't know this woman particularly was a forest service. And we ran into her and her group of friends and we're just, they asked me about my cup in the digging stick that I was walking with and we told them and they were, they were extremely supportive and thought it was so cool. And they're like, Oh, this is cool. Cause she's with the forest service and likes plants a lot. And we were talking about how we plant, we're planting seeds and reseeding indigenous first food plants. And, and she was like all about it. She's like, what's your podcast? I want to let me, I'll write, let me write down your name so I can follow you on Facebook. We actually Instagram. saw that forest service person again because we did a lot of extra hiking on the trail and we uh, there's like a section where it splits in two and then rejoins and you can choose which side you want to go on and we actually did both and somehow we saw her on that loop and then we saw her again later i don't even know how this happens with a lot of people yeah on the show she she recognized us she's like y'all are the plant people we're like who are you and she's like i'm the forest service woman that you met i was like oh my god that's so funny and she was like really curious she asked us how we were doing and we caught up and and yeah i don't know there's so that was kind of cool you know that's really encouraging to hear yeah it is it 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 really is i mean also the the forest service doesn't just because everybody's and everybody who works in that organization of the government or whatever that that branch of the government they're all individual people with their own perspectives on things and their own reasons for doing their work you know and um it we can't always assume that they're they're all in agreement with this idea that yeah that we shouldn't do these kind of things you yeah, know because the forest service as a bureaucracy is riddled with corruption and its own bs and i'm sure that these people that work for the forest service and that are the people that are on the ground getting dirt time spending most of their time in the field are seeing like have a lot of issues with the higher ups in the office that control the budgets and have the big names that have no field time and that run and that call the shots you know and this is something that we were educated about because we found this land reader about the rocky mountains particularly and it spoke about the history of rangers and national parks and the the just like the the corruption of the higher-ups and the just the dysfunction of the bureaucracy and like the people that love the work that want to do the work just so they can be in the field and put up with the bullshit just so they can be in the field and have to find ways to navigate the complexities of like corruption in the higher up from the higher ups that just to prove a point will cut budgets and that make decisions from a place of um, not coming from a place of experience in the field and really knowing you know, so that's like one thing we notice is that I feel like a lot of these really big decisions are made by people who aren't living with the land. They're living in an office bureaucratic space and the Forest Service ultimately manages f- with profit motive in mind first, you know, but then there's actually good people that work for the Forest Service that see that, that don't like it, but that, you know navigate that regardless but um i was just thinking back wrapping back around to this sort of um seeing gardens on the land or like uh and our sort of participation on it and how trying to talk to people and explain that to people it's like it took me some time to try to figure out how to work it out in my mind and like how to actually articulate it and I'm still kind of working on that but when you think about it you're like why wouldn't people like Gabe said it's not like that people just wandered around and hoped to find food people are smart humans are are ingenious like we we want to know that a camp that we're coming to seasonally is going to have why would we why would we come to a camp that had no food that we knew had no food there. You know, I think that the, that line between cultivated and wild 
blurs in that place of like, yeah, people, if you live in nomadic camps, if you're coming to the same places every year, you're digging these roots, you're creating moderate disturbance. Why wouldn't you then put the seeds back in the holes? It's kind of almost like, why wouldn't you do that? You know, to me, I'm just like, why wouldn't people divide plants and have more there next year or plant the seeds back so that they knew there would be more there next year? It's just like the logic of why wouldn't you is really like comes in my mind a lot of um, when you really think about the lived experience of, of, yeah, of living that way. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense not to, you know, but we live in a world now where we can go get everything we need at the grocery store. So it's hard for us to like put ourselves in that place. But when trying to explain to people like that, these, these plants could have very well been, seeded by humans or um you know the other ways that you can propagate like root division or quorum division or uh putting part of a root back like in the case of bitter root for example you can split it in half and put the other bit back you know uh it just it doesn't make sense that people didn't you know because like yeah people didn't wander around hoping to find food they want they knew where the food was and they made sure that their children were going to have access to that too so I want to go back to the a term you just used, uh, moderate disturbance. That's an actual term. You didn't make that up. And it's uh, and, and what you're referring to is the fact that um, some disturbance is beneficial for uh, ecology and for particular plants. Yeah, we saw we really thought about disturbance a lot on the trail because, yeah, uh we were like what does moderate disturbance act- disturbance actually look like on the land like yeah uh and we were just fascinated by that concept of disturbance because you know a lot of things we hear is like we need to l- tread lightly on the land right like we need like that whole no touch thing that pristine wilderness thing is like not touching at all but we all know that like not touching is problematic because um, some plants are evolved to propagate themselves through some level of disturbance. And it's not just humans that are part of that disturbance. It's weather. It's avalanches, we realized. Oh, <laughs> Avalanche shoots do a lot for this as well. Grizzly bears, you know, different like buffalo, like these different animals other than humans or sort of natural events like avalanches or storms that knock down you know a whole forest or whatever yeah oh beavers um although often we're like is this moderate disturbance like the way this beaver is completely altering like three miles of this river is this moderate or extreme disturbance and sometimes i you know this avalanche we saw a lot of avalanche shoots which are these like you know it's not the snowy time of the year we saw these areas where like literally a whole mountainside had been swiped. Like the snow pretty much took out a whole forest. Yeah. Yeah, Like a whole forest and it all got gathered down at the bottom of the hill, the mountain. And in the wake of that was like all these new Aspen trees coming up or all these new wildflowers coming up, Yeah, you know, and fire is another one of those when humans intentionally, put fire on the landscape, you know, it created moderate fire disturbance versus now because we can't do that. We're having these giant wildfires, which is more extreme disturbance. Yeah. And it's like, we've definitely been thinking about where, what does moderate disturbance actually look like? And sometimes I feel like certain kinds of disturbance that feel from a human perspective, bigger and more extreme still have really positive impacts on the land but then like something like that giant mine is a kind of extreme disturbance that humans have uh participated in and like caused and imposed on the land that isn't creating more diversity or isn't creating more uh health health for the land it's a kind of disturbance that seems to take from the land and degrade it you know and um so modern disturbance in the sense of what we were doing by literally just like uh planting seeds in maybe the 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 molehills 
you know, that are already like this fresh turned dirt that the yep. the underground creatures are already turning up, you know. Or I would take my cup and and I would I would tear up the ground and pull up these big chunks of dirt and create all these cracks. And fuck, sorry, my dog is um really trying to demand all the attention right now and using her big tail to knock over things. Um, uh, we would, yeah, I would use my cup in to really plow up the earth and, um, plant the seeds in those cracks. And we would, when we would dig biscuit roots to eat, we would, um, leave the holes open, which is creating this disturbance in our digging. And we wouldn't just like do the leave no trace, make it look like we weren't digging biscuit roots. We would leave the holes open and plant seeds in it but all the biscuit roots around them that hadn't gone to seed that had the se- whose seeds aren't ripe when they are ripe we left all these nice open cracks and crevices in the rocks and in the soil to for them to fall into so um it we're we're, we're helping propagate these plants through disturbance and we also noticed that avalanche shoots were more diverse than the areas around them. Like the plants growing in avalanche shoots, there was more densities of different kinds of plants. And it really made sense when we observed and contemplated it, where we'd come into these avalanche shoots where there's biscuit roots and mariposa lilies growing in really high densities. And that when that avalanche comes through it literally smears all the land, all the seeds across the landscape and disturbs the dirt and pushes the seeds into the dirt. It rips up tree root balls, exposes all this. It turns up the soil. And we, we thought we could probably spend a whole summer just, ex, just exploring the plant life in avalanche shoots alone. We realized like how incredible of uh planting mechanism avalanches actually are and um grizzly bears are another person on the landscape that are pretty much like expert wildflower gardeners because they with their big long root digging claws they plow up a lot of earth in search of the edible starchy bulbs underground and they replant the corms while they do that, but they also help water percolate into the landscape. They, uh, you know, bring up minerals and up to the surface of the dirt, you know, even when they're like digging for digging into hibernating rodent dens, they are just creating this disturbance in any, uh, they're kind of like, there's a nitrogen relationship where when bears like really disturb the earth and they dig up the earth, they actually bring nitrogen up to the surface. Well, obviously you know. there's no more grizzly bears in Colorado. Yeah. And there's no more Buffalo. Oh, yeah. well, there's a little bit of preserve, like a preserve, I think with some Buffalo yeah. or bison. Yeah. It's, um, we read a piece while we were walking on, it was like a scientist who studied grizzly bears or like the way that they used to have impact on the land. And it was pretty, apparently just the way that they, they affected the land was very, I mean, of course what's extreme, what's moderate. I don't know, but, um, they, they did a lot of like land altering, you Mm -hmm. know, and, Obviously, tilling up the whole Midwest to plant soybeans is a kind of disturbance and and churning of the earth that doesn't promote, you know, um, a diversity or doesn't promote like maximum ecological health, land health, you know. Uh, but this kind of yeah, like um, a grizzly bear digging up all the bisque roots on a hillside, and then those seeds get pushed to, pushed into the ground. They love to eat bisque roots too. Um, 
is, you know, and there's still a lot of thing, a lot of bushes that have roots still in the ground and there's still trees and it's like, it's different, you know? Yeah. I mean, the scientists that wrote this piece said that after the grizzly did its work on the land, it was torn up. Like there's like craters everywhere and the disturbance that they created is massive but the areas where the grizzlies bears do this on a regular basis have the highest densities of uh wildflowers that have edible starchy roots and bulbs and corns so, so the, the bears themselves were gardening one could say they're expert wildflower gardeners according to what this scientist he called them expert wildflower gardeners <laughs> some of the best on the landscape so you're you're um so when you were out there and you're planting seeds, uh, you were uh, making up not just for the fact that there uh, are not so many humans doing that in the area right now, but that there are other animals who are not doing it there right now. Yeah, and that's something I just I mean I thought about but hadn't thought about a, as much, and then we just kind of started to find out more both through our experience and reading about these other creatures or other kinds of disturbances, you know, and uh, it was, yeah, just like reaffirms. Uh, yeah. It reaffirms that, that kind of network that humans were a part of and still could be a part of, you know? Yeah. And um, are, are still a part of because uh, yeah, we are, this is still happening, there you know. Are, and there are people, and, they, and I don't want to use past tense necessarily because there's yeah. lots of indigenous peoples that still there's, wild tend and land tend, yeah, and hold those practice cultural practices. Yeah, like we wouldn't be able to do this because of that. Be, like if it because because um, of the resilience of people, na indigenous peoples who survived and kept this knowledge alive. You know. Yeah, at really risky costs to their lives and to their families' lives and to their culture, they kept this alive and that's why we have access to it today. And it's like it um and that's yeah, so it's important to acknowledge that and it, it can be kind of an interesting slippery slope sometimes with this. Some people say that might be like maybe appropriative that we do this, but I think that there is a way to be extremely culturally sensitive and nuanced and still be able to do this too, you know? Yeah. There's a man I know, uh, Randy Woodley. You, yeah, you've, you've heard of him because uh, he's interviewed in that book uh, that I wrote the, the wild tending book. That was wow. a great interview. Yeah, right. Way. Yeah, that the one, one about amazing. about decolonizing the Western mind. Yeah, in there he talks about uh, how uh, it's not just about actions, but it's about values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Principles, right? Like when when the more you observe this, and the more when you get out and you start practicing it and you experiment and you see what happens and you take it from the theory into the practice, you start to see that there's like principles that need to be honored that instill empathy and care into, I don't know, this, I've noticed it in myself is the process of the, the care that I start to feel and with that care, the deep mourning and grieving that comes with seeing uh, the consequences of our collective actions, you know, but and because, yeah, this is value, this, you start to see just the, the values of living in right relations with the land. It's a, it's a, it's like the first priority in your life. And everything is like the centerpiece in, of your life where everything is built upon right relations. And, um, but, you know, I think a lot about value versus actions a lot. And from a, like a philosophical perspective, uh, there's a lot there with that. Like uh, w whether you work from a place of doing or of, well, my values ma ma matter the most. Or do you work from a place of like what actions I have value the most? And I think there's 
a little bit of both, you know, like having only values, but not acting is one thing. And then having, and just acting, but having no values behind it is another thing. And having a little bit of like both holding both, um, and constantly being open to kind of, uh, maybe those, some of those actions aren't good and we gotta be, we gotta reevaluate or do they actually reflect, um, my values or our values and what what should be a good value to have in our actions behind our actions you know and that's something we kind of thought a lot about too while walking is like what is the right way to do this and do we even know you know um so yeah it's yeah can you talk a little bit about what kind of seeds you brought and, and where the seeds were from and why you made those choices? And then uh, were there any that you were like, oh, these don't belong here or wow, these really do? Yeah, let's see. Uh, we brought so we you know, when you do a through hike, a lot of people mail themselves packages of food along the way to post offices or to uh, places in towns that are close to the trail where you can pick up packages. So in our food resupply packages, which we didn't mail ourselves like one for every, you know, we did some caches and we also uh, bought food sometimes and we also uh, foraged a little bit, but we would put seed bundles in the, in our resupply packages and and generally we we sent ourselves kind of a menu of things that are pretty similar the whole trail but there were some areas where Gabe because he had done the trail before he knew kind of certain areas would probably the certain seeds would be better in certain areas so we brought um like he mentioned before uh, we brought different biscuit root seeds or we sent ourselves different biscuit root seeds and biscuit roots are sort of this is this kind of name that encompasses a group of plants in the carrot family that have edible roots that all look kind of different depending on the plant uh, and different parts of the West. There's a different cultural kind of relationship that people have had with different types of, you know, biscuit roots you know, and some of them grow all over the West and some grow only in certain areas. And uh, so some are very abundant all over and, and many are mo- more regionally specific, but the seed bundles of biscuit root seeds that we sent ourselves, I'm pretty sure Gabe, right. They, that they were all mixed together. Like, yeah. So uh, you said like six or seven species. Roughly, yeah. Roughly, yeah. and and there were a mix of lamatium and mostly some... lamatium. The Sumatras that we planted were from the seed that we gathered on trail. So a lot of the biscuit roots we were seeing actually on the trail were more Sumatras genus, but they're both considered any. Uh, you know, when you mix this whole Latin thing with like indigenous knowledge, there's like these sort of ways they flow in and out and make sense and don't make sense together sometimes, right. but. Yeah, um, which is a whole other conversation in some ways, like the whole Latin name thing. But uh, we, yeah, a lot of the seeds that we brought were uh, biscuit root seeds that Gabe had gathered last summer, right? Yep. On the tablelands. Yeah. And other parts of Oregon, is that correct? Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. He was asking, like, kind of more about what seeds we brought and where they came from and stuff. Yeah. Like yeah, some sorry. of those, some of those were ones we gathered. Uh, you know, I was helping to gather with y'all up on table we were land together. last year, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's when we first hung out and partied. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, table land, Yampa, um, a lot of Lomatia macrocarpum from the tablelands and from northeast Washington, and. And then other different kinds of lomatiums from north central Idaho and um, a lot of Calicortis lily seed from the tablelands, the macrocarpus, Calicortis macrocarpus, which is like the, the one of the bigger 
Mariposa lilies. And so this is where people get a little weird about us planting because it's like not they're not from Colorado. They're not super regionally specific, even though a lot of these different biscuit roots actually grow in different parts of Colorado. But part of the goal of this is with climate change, we're trying to diversify the genetics. So, but also the thing is, this is, gets into a whole thing that we've been talking about a lot with each other and kind of links to you and Nikki's work on, on writing that zine about uh, rethinking invasive, the idea of invasive plants too. It's just mm-hmm. like, what is a native plant? What is an invasive plant? What is a plant that belongs somewhere and doesn't is a complicated whole thing and you know another part of the whole wild tending history on the land is that humans did bring plants from far away or traded plants from far away seeds or roots to replant or or corms or whatever to replant and there's evidence on the land too that some of the of what we see I mean, is it native or not? If someone, if a human brought it there, you know, like that's like yeah. a weird thing. I mean, I went to Hawaii last year too, and that <laughs> talking about native plants versus endemic plants versus uh, canoe plants versus, you know, it's like, what is a native plant in Hawaii is like hard to talk about because like the Polynesian folks have been bringing plants to the islands for thousands of years and they naturalize, they become a part of the culture. Like they are native plants in some ways to those places. But yet like uh, when you're on the mainland and you talk about like this, you know, an island is, it can be seen in a different way because it's um, in like the human impact on these islands and how they became places of abundant food and medicine and like fiber plants and all these things is one is like a is one thing but like seeing it on the mainland and like really acknowledging the reality that that happened here too um is harder for some reason for people to like comprehend again that humans could have brought you know some kind of lily from far away and and brought here because it was good food and it was beautiful and you know and uh, there is proof of that, too, because there is a disjunct population of wild hyacinth, which is a type of brodia lily bulb that is really good food, in one county in southwest Colorado, and that only grows, like, really more up in the northwest area, and even botanists, I've done research on this, and I've read it in a plant book, and in uh uh, Colorado native plants website when they talk about this particular wild hyacinth even these botanists and local plant enthusiasts are like yeah the natives the only explanation we have for this one disjunct population is that the natives brought it here because they liked it as food you know and that population has thrived you know or is now like there and now yeah. it's, it's native it's, it's, na- native. it's native i don't know it's, it's just... weird it really is weird and we we were trying to explain this to people and after a while i just didn't have the energy to explain it to every single person that asked what was up i just said like look us up on instagram we have to go like i really don't have the energy <laughs> to like explain this to every single person that comes by because it's a big conversation and we don't know where these conversations are going to go with people but that is uh is really cool though because yeah we 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 don't acknowledge that reality in turtle island is that you know humans are we're landscape modifiers and we're habitat modifiers we do it today in our industrial you know american cultural world and it has been done for as long as humans have been here, you know, we're like beavers. We modify the landscape to fit our cultural needs. And, and that's just a reality. So, yeah. So we had biscuit root seeds and then we had a uh, different yeah, yampa. yampa, which is like a kind, another carrot family plant that uh, is, what's the genus again? Para. Periduridii. Periduridii. And actually, there is Yampa in Colorado, but it's in the north West. uh, western area of Colorado. There's yeah. even like a whole band of Utes called the Yampa. Yeah. Band. The Yampa. Utes. And there's like a river in 
called Yampa. It's interesting. The Yampa River. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't see any growing on the Colorado Trail proper, yeah. but we did plant it and uh, a lot of wild onion seed. And we saw lots of wild onions everywhere. And yeah. actually, by the end of the trail, the walk, we were gathering seed. Yeah. Uh, we gathered OSHA seed. There was so much OSHA we, at the we, end. We put together this wonderful seed bundle. I think it's the like the coolest seed bundle we've ever put together, but it's OSHA, uh, wild onions. And it's like a different kind of wild onions that we only saw once we got into the San Juan mountain range across highway 550 and, um, some opters biscuit root is a really cool seed mix. And we're going to go back up soon to harvest some medicine and, plant this and there's actually a uh, glacier lily seed in it too because we stumbled upon some glacier lily patches and we planted a lot of the seed where we found them but then we found other patches that had enough seed for us to put in this seed bundle too so that was pretty special that seed bundle and um yeah the the there was also a lot of camas we we did send ourselves a lot of camas seed and uh, that was a tricky one because I was trying to figure out where to plant this camas. I harvested a lot of this camas up in the Cascades in Oregon, and I was trying to find the similar habitats to that. And we ended up, we did plant a good bit of camas, um, but that was one that I, for some reason, I feel a little bit more stingy with my camas seed because I didn't have as much of it, and I was like with lilies you can do experimental plantings with bulbs first to see if it's even worth planting seeds in certain places because if you plant the bulbs in a place and they thrive and they do good you know that you can come back and like plant it thick with seed and in the beginning of the trail um i had a huge bag of blue dicks bulbs and wild that's onions a, that's a kind of brodea right blue dicks yeah the br- yeah and yeah. it's such a fun name <laughs> it's the best yeah it's the best and from new mexico where you are actually oh really cool mm-hmm. yeah we brought it from up there and uh, we we planted that in the lower elevations within the first 70 miles of the trail because it, in, in the front range it starts around like six or so thousand feet and it, and it builds its way up and it goes up in elevation. So we planted a lot of blue dicks in the beginning at the lower elevations. And uh, we've also, yeah, so bulbs was a fun thing to plant on the trail. We actually had some walking onions too. Our friends joined us for a couple of days. They brought us some walking onion seed. And then we actually found some in a hiker town in someone's permaculture uh planting in their front yard nice and we were w- walking by we were like, oh my god look at all these walking onions and we just started kind of grabbing some of the seeds and then they were across the street they were like oh hey <laughs> and they were like they were like grab as many as you want you know and then we yeah. kind of told them what we were doing and they were like that's cool that's great take as many seeds as you want so we actually ended up with more at some point yeah and uh so we planted some of those yeah. too <laughs> but... <laughs> nice yeah we found this type of wild garlic once we got into the Lagarita wilderness and this was cool seeing like we got used to the same plants baseline for the whole trip. And then randomly these new, particularly alliums would pop up. Like there was this really unique kind of wild garlic just in the beginning of when we entered the San Juan mountains and the Lagarita wilderness that they were pretty much like walking onions. It's really interesting. They're like, um, their seeds were just like these little seed bulbs that would fall into the ground and become their own thing, just like walking onions do. I mean, you know, when you were a farmer too, if you let your garlic go to flower and then go to seed, that was, that would be what would happen, yeah, you know? exactly. And so that was what we were finding is like yeah. these garlics that had gone flowered and gone to seed and they had their little mini bublet bulblets yeah. at the top. And so we were like, Oh, this is cool. So we would take those and replant them. So too. At, when we would make camp, we would pick a bunch of those. And then at our camps after that, we would 
we'd have our camp and be like, well, there's no, we don't see any of this wild garlic right here on the other side of this mountain. So let's plant it right here. So if we ever come back here, we can like garnish our food with some of this <laughs> wild garlic. And, and that was one, one kind of like wild tending on the go that was easier. But after a while though, it really got hard to stop and plant constantly it, it because water and weather and um, other factors kind of control what you do more than what you think you want to do controls what you do. And there was areas where we wanted to plant stuff, but we were low on water. There was, it was really hot and a storm could come in at any second and our backpacks were heavy and stopping to take our backpacks off, to pull the seed bundles out, to take the time to plant. And if we had big days, we'd mean we would get into camp late and it's a, it was difficult. We, it was an experimental model, right? So I think, yeah, in the beginning we had a lot more energy of walking every day and like taking the time to plant and like had a little less, worry about how far we went and there was also water everywhere so it was kind of like fine yeah, to do easy. that yeah but it's by like the last third of it we were going through an area called the Cochatopa hills which is like a lot of sagebrush which would be ideal for certain plantings lots of cows in that area lots of cows because we you know different sections of the trail there's different sort of there was like a bushy single foil plant too that's kind of like sagebrush in that way of like how tall it grows and it, but it can grow more in the wet zones and stuff but just these sort of nurse bushes for some of these plants we were finding we're like oh great this would be a great little area to put a patch of biscuit roots there's already some growing here we know they'll thrive you know but then the Cochitopa hills were just so hot and the water was few and far between and it was there was a lot of cows so the little bit of water there was, was full of cow shit. So there were some t- some days where I'm just like, I got to get through this day. Like it's so hot out like that. To imagine stopping at 2 PM with in the 90 temperatures in the nineties, there's no shade, you know, to plant. I was just like, I can't, I got to keep going. Right. So yeah. definitely had some days like that. Yeah. And that was the beauty of the learning experience. We just had the, reality check of okay this is this is a great learning experience about what works and what doesn't work about this plan to go kind of model of doing this you know and but we scouted some great places because in the Cochitopa Hills for example that this is a place where we could go and camp for months and not be bothered you know it's like was the part of Colorado we finally got into where tourists were not really interested in it because everywhere else was just insanely busy with tourists, but this place was just not, there was nothing going on there. It's cow town. It's hot. Most of the spruce for all the spruce forest is dead and it's just different. So we were like, okay, let's pinpoint this spot. And if we ever get a chance to come back here and do a base camp for a while, we can plant some stuff here. But there's a weird thing with the cows too, because the cow is, we're really overgrazing there. And when we entered the Lagarita wilderness at the end of the Cochitopa Hills, there was cows in the wilderness too. And let's, let's talk about the, the cattle for a, a couple minutes here, because I think that something that most people don't understand is that cattle are allowed on public land throughout the uh, Western United States, even in some national parks and even in some wilderness areas. Yeah. Yeah, this was a this was a interesting interesting one that we really explored the cattle topic cuz we went through three different wilderness areas. Uh two of them had cows in them and one of them had uh massive herds of sheep in them. And and that was in the San Juan Wimanoots wilderness and the sheep we'd seen just like man these sheep have torn this place up like they had really damage the tundra i was thinking a lot about what does moderate disturbance mean in relationship to modern day grazing practices and uh i've been trying to just also like educate myself more about 
I don't know if it's a, I, I don't really know the science of like how ultimately the, how can, can grazing even be done in a positive way? You know, I know Buffalo used to be on the land and they're much bigger, heavier creatures than cows, but part of it is about this enclosure thing of like, if these cows stay in one place too long, they can really mess up a place, you know, versus being able to freely roam wherever they they feel like going and having apex predators like wolf to keep their populations at a certain point and to like put pressure that keeps them moving on them too because i was thinking a lot about like am i wrong about this like is it actually bad to have cows out here like you know it's not like we saw a feedlot or anything i mean there was definitely like a lot of space for them to to roam but I don't know, some of the places that it was just highly eroded, the water was very funky, um, and... The the sheep actually really messed up one part of the trail, like, I got all mixed up on the trail because they, they almost, they walk in a way across the slopes where they create, like, all these little trails that kind of tear us down from one another, and they created a lot of erosion on one part and this one part that we saw and then but the big thing that stuck out to us was just this double standard with people they're like don't cut switchbacks don't walk on the tundra don't pee on the tundra because marmots will come and and eat your pee and tear up the tundra and don't do this just don't do anything just stay on the trail and visit and then leave okay but they let cattle walk on the tundra they let sheep walk on the tundra and we saw just like this double standard because and we met this person who was telling us about this hundred this these two different races that come into the san juans out of lake city colorado one's a 50 mile race one's a hundred mile race a bike race Uh, a foot it's like a running it's like a ultra ultra marathon thing and they said that the forest service there was still some snow on the trails and the people would have had to run around the snow on the trail and just for one day, right? Like have a handful of runners like running on the tundra around the trail, get back on the trail. And the forest service said that they would revoke their permit to do the race if they did that and that they didn't want anybody running off of the trail. But in the same exact area, we saw a bunch of cows grazing on the slopes above 12,500 feet and the guy that was telling us about this said this is the first time I've ever seen them run cows in this area and uh, it's kind of not usual here to see cows like up this high and you know think about like just the impact of you know 50 people running a foot race across the tundra real quick and to get back on the trail to go around the snow versus like Uh, 50 head of cattle grazing in one area with, you know, it's like a 1200 pound animal with uh, hoofs that don't distribute the weight of their body, like big flat human feet do. And you just, we just saw the double standards. And that's one thing that was like really just the, the, the principle of, of the matter was just the double standards because of money, you know, and, uh, ranchers, just some historical context for people is that ranchers mining and ranching in Colorado and in the West, you know, was what people came out here to do. And cattle were crucial to the survival livelihood and um, food needs of the settler Europeans that came out and colonized the West. And the ranchers got like the best first pickings on the land and they still have those the land today you know where i'm from here in colorado uh where i grew up outside of durango you know i there's like old mormon families that have lived out there for a long time and old spanish families that have lived out here for a long long time and they own most of the land they own most of the water and it would just became or they've grandfathered they get grandfathered into positions of political privilege and land access privilege and power that is really abused you know and the public lands that were created often have the a lot of them get leased certain designations of public lands get leased for ranching or for like 
cattle and stuff like that. And usually uh, these families, you know, even if there's an area where they're like, we're not going to do this anymore, they get to keep their leases a lot of the time in that area. And I remember doing a tr- that tr- this trip last year with Signal Fire, who I mentioned earlier, this organization I mentioned earlier in the podcast, in the Blue Range Primitive Area, which is like this area between New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, and it's supposed to be a wilderness area, but they call it a primitive area because when they were trying to preserve that area, I guess, uh, they, a bunch of ranchers got mad about it and they wanted to still be able to roam their cows in a certain way on that land and, uh, still have all the rights that they've had, you know, to do that. And so they weren't able to make it an official wilderness area. Cause I guess technically if it is an official so-called wilderness area, they're not, you're not really supposed to put cows yeah. on it technically. <laughs> um, but these people, because the local politics favor, you know, Ranchers, these people who've yeah. been there for however many generations or yeah. whatever, they just turn the other eye because people want to, be able to still do what they've been doing and it's a part of yeah. the heritage it's a part of yeah. there's like a sense of entitlement i mean and also i don't want to i don't again people are individuals and not maybe not everyone who who does what whatever ranching is like there's a lot of manifestations of what that is aren't necessarily like don't care they don't all as one big group not care about the land but there's definitely a lot of impact that cows in particular have on the land and um yeah and it's just really crazy to me that just a few people have so yeah. much ability to spread out yeah. so much you know because here um some of the old rancher families here where i'm from in durango and outside of durango area they are they're like in the their descendants of the original families that settled this area and they're in the local uh county commissioner body politic politi- political bodies you know they're they're a part of the political decision making processes that happen here in this local area so they get there's like the good old boys club um it's just interesting. aspect of it interesting you know. to me that these folks have so much short of right to do this in a lot of places in the west but yet like a lot of indigenous peoples whose traditional homelands this is on can't even go gather their medicines half the time in certain places i don't know it's like um it's okay to just say wow this is fucked up that people who have been here you know i don't people have been here for because you know six or eight generations in a place you know big freaking deal compared to people who've been here for like five thousand or eight thousand years or whatever i mean you know i i don't really personally feel a need to even be polite about it because i look at what ranchers are doing and i'm like you know like acres per person ranchers are the single most destructive people in the west you know, I mean, yeah. think of how yeah. one man can have power over 10,000 acres, you know, and yeah. keep, you know, keep all the trees off of it, destroy all the wetlands in it, destroy all the streams in it, you know, keep anybody else out. I mean, it's just the it's the opposite of sustainability. And while there might be like a few standout, you know, permaculture people who figure out a way of doing it in a way that's not so bad here and there like that's just a fraction of a percent you know i mean the the vast majority of it is just it's just sheer abuse is what it is and i'd be curious to get your perspective on this more because my perspective of this comes purely from having grown up in a rural area of ranching culture and having observed firsthand ranching culture and its effects on the land and just knowing like the political privileges that the local ranching families are born into and have power over. I know that you're connected with the range watch and that you have actually done, you've done a lot more extensive research into this. It's something that I'm realizing that I need to do more of, but my perspective only comes from like what I've seen, but we would be, I I am curious about your perspective of this more too. And my perspective. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're calling it though, from what you've seen, you know, like, 
that is how it goes, you know? Yeah. 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 And my perspective comes from too growing up in the rural South where my grandparents on both sides and my great grandparents all grew tobacco and had cows. It's totally different there and it's not any better or anything, you know, and there is also that entitlement of like Southern families who've been there. You know, my family was in the same place. It's been in the same place, like six generations and this, like, uh, this is our land, our home, our place. We belong here. We can do what we want thing, but there's a different dynamic with, there's not like public land in the same way. So like, there's a different dynamic around like how cattle are handled and treated and the land certainly suffers just the same i feel like personally i mean i don't see people doing the feedlot model but still i mean at least in the place where i grew up but still um yeah that's the experience i'm coming from too and so this is all interesting to me to observe too seeing how it is out here you know yeah and the rancher, I mean, we met this guy in the Gila wilderness this winter who said that back, you know, not that long ago, he was, he went and reported all these local ranchers that were running their cows like deep into the Gila wilderness. He's kind of like a hippie activist guy. He's been there for a while too, you know, and he just, he goes out there with his horses to let his horses run around, not in the wilderness, but just like in the national forest, you know, and he takes his horses out, but he, um, he said that when he went and reported those ranchers one night, somebody comes onto his land and turns all his horses loose. And like they, the ranchers started bullying him and threatening him and like fucking with his horses and stuff after he did that, you know? So there is like this kind of uh, bullying that happens with this too, because of the political and, the, just the socioeconomic privilege that ranchers have flex over is something that is pretty real. And I think that it's really abused. Well, the the history of these areas is, as you said, the ranchers were, you know, pe- people came into ranch and to mine, right? And so the ranchers who came in were there. And when the territorial governments were formed, they were part of that. And then when the states were formed, they were part of that. So they helped form the Western states and yep. basically from that time, from the 1800s, early 1900s, when these places became states, their uh, state houses, you know, and their counties have been run, you know, with a huge ranching influence and the people they send to Washington, D.C. as well. So this is, yeah, they, they have uh, an outsized uh, political influence considering their percentage in the population, which is not that big. And also considering their share in the local economies, which is not nearly as big as they want you to believe it to be, you know, like uh, agriculture and and ranching is, is is much smaller part of the economy than than it once was in a lot yeah. of these places. And I'd have to go look at these numbers. But but yeah. And, you know, back east where Kelly is from uh, there, it's about, oh, how many cows can I have per acre? Whereas here in the West, it's how many acres do I need per cow? Just because yeah, the landscape true. is so much more arid. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, e- even if someone, you know, is like really a big beef fan and they want to make sure, you know, that's their perspective. Well, you could get rid of most of the cattle in the West and you'd still most and, and 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 it wouldn't impact the industry as a whole that much because most cattle are 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 are, are, are back east. Yeah. And honestly, there's a lot. Well, there's a lot going on now where they're cutting down the rainforest to put cows down in the South America that's starting to happen. And I, I feel like the ranching industry or a cow cattle industry is kind of on its way out in the West, but there's like this nostalgic att- attachment and they get subsidies and like, there's a lot that they're trying to do to kind of keep a hold of it, the remnants of it, you know, just like how mining, I mean, there's a lot of mountain mining in the Southwest still very much so, but like, uh, you know, a lot of these tourist towns that we're going, we walked through, we walked to get a resupply and whatnot. Mining is not really part of the industry anymore. So like they're using tourism to prop up the town tourism that glorifies the history of mining that used to happen there, which is so odd. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, these, ext- the extractive industries of the, of the cows are, are kind of on the way out in the West, but 
yeah, there, there's still like this, the structures are in place to kind of keep whoever's still doing it kind of as doing it as long as they can. But ultimately, yeah. I don't know if it's going to end up being able to be, I mean, I don't think it's good that it's being exported to South America either because we need to keep that rainforest, you know, yeah. and it's not cow's fault. This is one thing I remember that's true. really feeling. I was like, it, the cows aren't doing anything wrong. They're just being cows. It's like us. It's like, and this is like the same thing with like invasive species, quote unquote, is that where we always find these scapegoats to blame when really we are the culprits because as like a hyper keystone species, humans have such a, powerful influence and we're not taking responsibility we want to maintain the status quo and find a way to blame something to you know we want to find a way to blame something so we can keep on living up to the status quo and and cows are like i think wrongfully blamed for what we do with cows it's not the cow's fault it's what we do with the cows that is the problem and I just think it's funny how people are always looking for like the enemy to blame when and never ever take responsibility for ourselves and for what we are doing and how in the case of invasive species, we are the niche creators for these opportunistic plants. You know, it's not the plant. There, there's no such thing as an evil malevolent plant. It's like us that they're just opportunistic responders to changes in ecology and we're creating the niches for these plants to come in and occupy but it's never our fault it's only the plant's fault you know so i just think that that's a big problem is like we're not taking responsibility you know right right so it's about time to wrap this one up uh this conversation for today i mean obviously i want to hear more about your trip and we'll have to get to that later but for today's recording uh, it's time to wrap it up because I've got another one coming up here soon. So uh, maybe you could just, you know, final messages and where to follow you guys uh, to see the cool stuff that you're doing. My Instagram handle is at goldenberries and um, at, uh, is it ground shots podcast? And my website is at sub of sedge and salt.com. And Finding me on Instagram at Goldenberries is an easy way to kind of get to everything else, too, that I do. And my podcast has a whole lot of different kind of topics and and areas of focus that all kind of link together. So I'm about to start kind of working on that again after we finish this walk. Um, but final thoughts, I mean... I don't know. I think that a lot of people have been messaging me. This is, you know, we've been putting a little bit out on social media about this walk here and there, and people are telling me they're inspired by what I'm doing or by what we're doing, and like it's giving them a different perspective on like some way that they too could potentially do something different on the land, and I just I think that. I want to encourage people to like to do that, to go out and like and um, experiment. What works for you? What do you What do you feel like actually is participating on the land and in, with the land in a good way, and that it that anyone can and you know um, are the way that we did this walk is is one way, and there's many other ways that can potentially happen and. Uh, I, yeah, I hope that it encourages people to feel like that they can try something themselves, you know? Yeah. Um, final messages on the walk, I guess, is that it was a it was an experiment and that we learned a lot. We put out a video and we talked about it a little bit here just about like on our Facebook and Instagram about the pros and cons of this model and that it's just like, Kelly said there's so many different ways to do that and um, I'm not trying to do this in a romantic idealistic way and be in what once was I'm exploring 
we're exploring what this means in the context of today's world and uh, it means a lot of different things and it looks a lot of different ways and it can be accessible to everybody everywhere uh city people in the cities people in small towns big medium-sized towns rural areas or public land um I, I hope that people start trying to figure out creative ways to wild tend and to just tend the land and start, you know, planting, doing guerrilla gardening and all this stuff. I just it makes, I hope that people start trying to experiment with what they have available to them. And in that they'll, we're going to start breaking down these like social dichotomies between what is wild and what is not and, and unseparating ourselves from the landscape. And um, you can find me on Instagram at plums for bums. And my Facebook is Gabe Crawford um, I'm plums for bums on Instagram because I love plums and bums need plums too. So we're, I'm actually about to be go out and harvest a bunch of plums to plant around the area for, you know, for that and uh that's like kind of my instagram handle is kind of like the spirit that i do this in <laughs> planting plums for bums pears for bears you know and uh yeah voices for nature and peace is produced in the gila river valley new mexico usa on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied apache territory the intro music is zero g yogi by big z with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.